I knew I was different. I've always known that. From almost my earliest memory. Eyes lighter, almost eerily so, said some people. Hair, a shade of red shining through. Taller, shapelier, even as a young teen. A movie star or a model, you would think. But this was 2,000 years ago, and I grew up in a small village. It was different. What I didn't know is that I was special. No one told me that. The story of the adulterous woman is one that begs many questions. Where was the man who she was caught with? Did she live in Jerusalem or in an outlying town? Did someone set a trap for her? Or was she just unlucky? Twenty years ago. It seems like yesterday. Or never. I grew up in a, in a small village near Hebron. I was from a typical Jewish family. Although, it was rumored that in generations past, one of my ancestors was a Moabite, a woman. No way to prove it though, we didn't have genetic testing. And unfortunately, we didn't know about recessive genes either. My cousins, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, and grandfathers, they looked just like the other people in my village. And so did my father, mother, brothers, and sisters. Me? Different. Choices for a husband were limited. I hoped that my father would at least go to Hebron to choose for me. Somewhere. Anywhere. But no. He owed a business debt to one of the other men in our village. A man who had a son who needed a good wife. A good wife who could have lots of babies. You know, like everybody else. Moses was his name, after the greatest prophet of the Jews. Truthfully, there was nothing wrong with my husband to be. There wasn't much right about him either. Plain and skinny, dull as a box of rocks from the wilderness. His mother, she was thrilled for our marriage. Surely between the two of us, our babies would at least be average, like everyone else. Committing adultery was a serious thing. It not only would break up a marriage, but if you were caught, you could be stoned according to the laws of Moses. And the people in my village were certainly mean enough and jealous enough to enjoy a good stoning. My husband and I, we went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles about two years into our marriage. During this feast, people live in tents in remembrance of the 40 years of wandering in the desert. I was thrilled to be out of the village. Oh, in Jerusalem, all kinds of people and all kinds of unusual things at the market. It felt good to be in such a place that was so different. We rented a room where I was to stay for a week while my husband and his friends went outside of town to stay in tents. On the third day, I went out to find some food for dinner. At the market, a man struck up a conversation with me. A very handsome man. I was surprised <laughs> and flattered to say the least. He could probably tell I was a small town married woman by my clothes and the way that I spoke. He only had one thing in mind, but I didn't know it. Small town, naive. The more we talked, the more he wove a web of desire and deceit. He told me all kinds of things. 
He told me I was special. I knew, I knew that I was different, but I had never heard that I was special. <laughs> sure, I knew the Ten Commandments. They didn't seem important at the time. We headed back through the market to my little room. I didn't see a woman. Not just any woman, a jealous woman. A jealous woman who was tired of her husband's affairs. A woman running to the temple to tell the authorities so she could finally have proof for the divorce she was entitled to. I was having second thoughts, but oh, it just felt so good to be special for once. Special, not different. I was caught in between. Every time I almost changed my mind, he would say something convincing. Sweet. Honey. Ugh, his words were like honey. <laughs> I made the choice. I chose. Make no mistake about that. The next morning, I awaken to a rising commotion outside. It's barely dawn. And the noise of the crowd is louder and louder. And in the dim light, I see a figure going out the back window. The door flies open. Caught. In the act. Well, close enough for the crowd of men who pour into the room. They grab me, drag me. I scream, I beg, I plead. Just a robe to cover myself. Please. The man hands me enough of my clothes that I can mostly cover myself. <laughs> the other men are disappointed that I do so. These religious men are disappointed that they lose the delicious shock value of justifiably dragging a naked, adulterous woman through the streets of Jerusalem. No effort whatsoever to chase after the man and bring him to justice. How did they know? Where are they taking me? I panic. We're moving toward the temple. My married life is over for sure. Maybe that my life is over as well if the crowd decides to stone me. Embarrassed. No, so far, <laughs> so very far past that. I close my eyes and suffer an eternity of despair. On temple grounds, the men push me through a crowd of people. They dump me on the dusty ground and step back. Face down, barely clothed, choking on the dust, Oh, I'm special, all right? I hear nothing. I mean, there's no sounds. Pandemonium turned to silence, complete silence. Then I'm jerked to my feet and made to stand. I open my eyes and what I see will never leave me. Ragged people surrounding me, a crowd of them. Behind them is the glare of the temple. The sunrise hitting the gold. Even God is there to see me. Dozens of men in fine, colorful robes nearby. Smug, angry, smug, angry. All of them staring at someone. Expecting to see my husband. I turned to see one other ragged man sitting on the step. He, he has this look on his face, I, I don't know, disgusted, but well, I can't describe it. And I couldn't look away. This woman was caught in the act of adultery, says the one whose robes are the finest. 
Moses commands that we stone her. What do you say? This is crazy. Why are they asking this one ragged man? Who cares what a ragged nondescript man says at a time like this when I am moments from death? The ragged man stares at the religious leaders. He's angry. But he's looking at them, not me. He leans over and sits on his heels, like the peasant men often do. He leans over further, toward me, toward the men, and writes in the dust. He writes in the dust. I'm living what may be the final seconds of my life, and he writes in the dust. Doesn't say a word. Save me, I plead. Except nothing comes out. I will learn that this man is someone everyone in the crowd knows is Jesus. More than that, I'll find that he is the great I am. He is God on earth. Finger writing in the dust is the same finger that inscribed the Ten Commandments, the finger that wrote, do not commit adultery into a stone tablet. This ragged, peasant-sitting judge is the judge of the entire universe. He truly has the power to save me, to save me in ways that nobody else can. There's no record that Jesus ever wrote anything else in his entire time on earth. Just these things in the dust. From my vantage point, I couldn't see what he was writing, but the religious leaders could. Was he giving them permission to stone me? Was he writing their sins in the dust? Was he writing the names of a few girlfriends in the crowd? What else could he be doing? The leaders continue to question him. They want him to say something. He stops writing, stares at the men, for forever it seems. The silence is so thick, so uncomfortable. The men stare at the writing in the dust. He stands. The one who is without sin his voice was loud, is the first one to throw a stone. And he drops back down, resumes writing word after word after word after word. The oldest of the religious leaders gathers his robes about him and leaves. A few of the other men follow him. Then one by one, all of my accusers turn and leave the oldest to the youngest. Jesus wipes away the words. Words from the eternal Lord, gone forever. Only those men know what they said. I don't even think the apostles knew what he wrote in the dust. He looks at me, with eyes tired, sad. Woman, where are the men who accused you? Nobody condemned you? Nobody, my lord. Then I don't condemn you either. Go in peace and stop sinning. Then he stands, turns, and walks away. The remaining crowd with him. I'm left alone, standing in the dust. I wish I could tell you that my husband came to rescue me, forgave me, and we lived happily ever after, that I was his faithful wife from that day forward and was content to live in our small village. But 
those kinds of endings maybe only happen in fairy tales. No. I finally struggled back to my small room where my husband is waiting. He's not happy. You can guess what happened next. Jesus' words don't excuse immorality. Go and sin no more. Don't miss the point. Stop sinning. But one more thing to note about my story. Truly a story that has been told throughout the ages. The world changed the moment the oldest religious man walked away. I saw it with my own eyes. The very actions of these religious leaders proved something they never intended. They wouldn't respond to Jesus' challenge about who was to cast the first stone in fulfilling the law. No. They turned to leave. Turned their backs on the law of Moses. If you could see it. I experienced it. And it made me feel... very special. <laughs>